Welcome to Terror in Tandem, a podcast about finding entertainment in the macabre, hosted by the knowledgeable and lovable Laura and Richard Mathiason. Each episode, we discuss the horror genre, from books to film to TV and beyond, sometimes even from the beyond. You can find us online at terrorintandem.com and on Instagram at Terror in Tandem. Hello. Happy June and Happy summer. Happy June. Yay. Love it. June bloom. I know. Uh, especially for allergies. My God. Oh, yeah. It's I like mean, a... it's not even June yet, but it's... Almost. Yeah. Sure. Sneezing like it is. By the time you're listening to this gentle listener, it will be June. It will. It will be a f- full-blown June. <laughs> as they say full, bl- full uh, june and flu- full bloom well or june gloom as those west coasters think say in between anyway. the sneezes um we've got some really fun recommendations for you yeah i like i i don't know i feel like back in the day uh summer used to be pretty slow for releases you know for for movies and I, I, you get like summer blockbusters but it felt like everything else slowed down and now there's just year-round content are you talking about horror in general i don't know i just talking about things you know like all the tv shows went on hiatus right and like things just sort of you had reruns and you'd have a couple like big movies to look forward to but i don't know i i think that's still you know gonna happen yeah for the most part with tv TV series. Is the new Mission Impossible coming out this year? I think so. I'm looking forward to that. I want to see, you know, how long Tom Cruise can continue throwing his body at high speeds out of moving objects. Well, I think that um, the the writer strike um, is probably going to impact the next year or two of yeah. releases and new content. So. And, you know, we do stand with the WGA. We do. Absolutely. So we're going to enjoy the things that have already been made. And I guess that means, like, Tom Cruise can't improvise any stunts if he's, you know, if it isn't written. Like, he's like, you know, I just really want to jump off of this mountain. I know you think it is, but it's not all about Tom Cruise. Oh. Has he even ever been in a horror movie? Vanilla Sky. Legend? I mean, Legend had the devil in it. It wasn't really horror, like it dark was fantasy. Not fantasy. Yeah. I no. Would say Vanilla Sky is the closest. Uh, yeah, but it was horrible. Eyes wide shut. That's a make remake we won't be doing because we don't like to do make remakes where the remake is really bad. Right. Abre los ojos, everyone. Watch that. That's a good movie. All right, so uh, why don't you jump into your first recommendation oh, for June? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to start off with a... Well, okay, I'm going to split my first into two. It's um, video games. Time. Time for video games. I mean, it's nice. It's beautiful outside. So why not lock yourself indoors in front of a screen? Like um, the best recluses do. Yes, absolutely. The sun burns and so does holy water. Um, first one is the one I'm really looking forward to, and that is Amnesia the Bunker, coming to you from Frictional Games on June 6th. That's going to be on PC. I forgot about that one. Yeah. Oh, uh, that was good. <laughs> I get it. Coming to you, coming out on uh, PC and current gen consoles. Um, so this is the fourth What's game. What's current gen consoles? You know, like Xbox Series X and S and, oh, um, the PS5. Not a future gen. No. Okay. Um, so it's the fourth in the Amnesia series, but it's not really a series. It's they're, The games are disconnected. But the thing that they do have in common is they are all really, really good and really scary. Mm. Um, so Amnesia Dark Descent was the first one. That's, a, that's an absolute classic. Um, this is the follow-up to the excellent Rebirth that came out a few years ago. Anyway, in the bunker, you play as a French soldier trapped in a bunker during World War I, uh, which is a cool setting. Uh, you're being hunted by a photosensitive creature called the Beast. Um, so like other amnesia games, it's first-person survival. But unlike other amnesia games, this one's less linear. It's a kind of semi-open world environment. Um, you actually can get a gun in this one. 
uh, although ammo is limited and it doesn't do much. So you're just basically constantly hunted by this thing, like Resident Evil 3 style. Um, and uh, you've got to keep the lights on because that's the only thing that drives it away. You've got to find out what's going on. It's almost definitely going to be scary as hell because the other games are absolutely terrifying. It's beautiful to look at, so I'm really, really excited about that. And it's procedurally generated, so the levels are always different. Every time you play, it's got a lot of replay value because it's really just about, the, I guess, the tension of, of this constant hunting presence that's it's always after you um so anyway that's coming june 6th also coming june 6th is the big one that's diablo 4 from blizzard entertainment i'm just gonna quickly Brr. mention it because um you know you probably know what it is i don't know how i feel about this one i love diablo it's a big part of my childhood and early gaming years especially um wasn't a big fan of diablo 3 and not a big fan of what has become of my once beloved Blizzard Studios. They have changed um, and, uh, you know, are under almost constant allegations of toxic work culture and sexism in the workplace and whatnot. And crunch. So, you know, mixed feelings about this one, although it does look like a return to form. If you're into these kinds of games, which are, you know, they're kind of mindless um, in, a, in a way, like it's, it's a sort of a feedback loop. Uh, where you're just gathering stuff. But Diablo always had this cool fantasy, pseudo-Catholic, over-the-top, kind of cheesy story that really worked in the first two games. And this looks like a return to that aesthetic, that really dark, grimdark almost environment. So, yeah, if you're into it, Diablo 4 is probably going to be great, you know. But um, June 6th, that's also coming out. Busy day. Awesome. That's awesome. Yay. Um, You're awesome. My first recommendation is The Boogeyman. Oh. It's a movie coming out June 2nd, so this coming weekend. Um, like the first weekend of June. Yeah. Um, Kick it off. It stars uh, Sophie Thatcher. She is currently in Yellow Jacket. She plays the teen Natalie, for those of you that are fans of that show, which it's great. Second season's nuts. Uh, Chris Messina also is in this film nice he's from argo and mindy project and sharp objects and and birds of prey yeah he was mr zazz he was really good well speaking of suicide squad oh um david dashman dashelman 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 yeah yeah he's also uh, in polka this dot film. man yeah from the suicide squad yeah he's awesome yeah he's he, really good he in has everything. that look he was in, he's in dune also yeah the Dark Knight he was in. He's been really taking off the last few years. He was in Ant-Man, the first two Ant-Man movies, the good ones. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's great. He's always great. So this um, this film is based on a short story written by Stephen King, who um, originally published a short story in 1973 um, in an issue of The Cavalier. Wow, that's and, an early yeah. effort from and Mr. King. And then he included it in... The 1978 short story collection, Night Shift, mm -hmm. which is a really great short oh, yeah. story collection. And also, speaking of the mass market paperback of Night Shift had amazing cover art. It really did. I remember being a kid and seeing that and just being so excited to one day sneak it past my parents. <laughs> um, the, the short story, the majority of it takes place in a, psychiat a psychiatrist's office where a man's telling... Uh, about the murder of his three children. And he definitely comes across as paranoid and possibly insane, like unreliable in the, in the short story. And so the film adaptation, um, the plot is about a high school girl named Sadie. So that's um, Sophie, the actress that I just mentioned. Sophie Yellowjacket? Yeah, so Sophie Yellowjacket and her younger sister, Sawyer. And they're dealing with the aftermath of their mother's death. And their father, Will, played by Chris Messina, is a therapist by profession. Um, and he doesn't offer any moral support or affection to the kids. Yikes. Um, I, great therapy. And then a desperate patient knocks on the door seeking help. He brings 
with him the presence of a terrifying entity that will soon be the source of their terrors. Nice. So quite a different adaptation. It would have to be. It's a very, very short story. Yeah. Um, I, I'm i interested to see how this is going to play out. I mean, the trailer looks very scary. Oh, we should mention it's directed by Rob Savage, who directed right. the phenomenal movie Host, mm -hmm. and then followed it up with the decidedly less phenomenal dash cam. Um, but Host was actually, I can't remember who did it, but I think it was scientifically there was an article about it It was scientifically proven quote unquote to be the scariest movie ever made i don't know if i agree with that but i do agree that it is a fantastically scary movie and very very good awesome well you know stephen king has never been shy about sharing his unvarnished opinion about adaptations of his work and he recently tweeted out i think he retweeted a, a review of the film the boogeyman uh, film yeah saying um Simply, this is some scary shit. Mm -hmm. So from the man himself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, if he doesn't like a movie version of his movie, he will really talk about talk it about literally it. for mm -hmm. 40 years. He's still talking about The Shining. Um, that's I can't so, wait. So yeah, check that out in theaters June 2nd. Coming at you. My next one is also a movie. It's not coming to you. In theaters, but it is Shutter. coming to you on our beloved Shutter. We do love Shutter. You're gonna do this Thank one. you, future sponsor Shutter. Um, I'm really, 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 really looking forward to this. June 9th on Shutter is Brooklyn Four Five, and the reason I'm looking forward to this: two words, Ted Gagan. Director and writer Ted Gagan has been making some of my absolute favorite indie fare of the last decade. Um, he is the direct, writer and director of We Are Still Here, which was a fantastic movie with uh, the beloved Barbara Crampton, and Mohawk, which is holy crap. That's a rough one. Um, just if you're going to watch Mohawk, it is brutal. But uh, he's really been putting out some fantastic stuff. This looks excellent. It premiered at South by Southwest uh, this year to rave reviews. It's got a wonderful cast of character actors, including... Legendary Larry Fessenden, uh, um, writer, director, cinematographer, editor extraordinaire. Uh, Larry Fessenden is is um, in the movie. So basically, uh, shortly after the end of World War II, Fessenden's character's wife dies, and he invites his, a group of friends over um, for drinks and you know conversation. But he kind of traps them there and forces them to engage in a seance to contact his wife. That seems to go about as well as most seances in movies go. Um, now, interesting thing about this movie, it's single location, and it is it unfolds in real time, um, like the movie Rope or the TV series 24. Hmm. Um, yeah, so it's basically, for, for those of you that don't know, a real-time film, it's quite rare, but what that means is every second of the movie is a second of real time. So an hour and 20 long minute movie, the story takes place over an hour and 20 minutes. Everything you watch is happening at the time you're watching it, basically. So um, it has been getting, like I said, great reviews. There are ghosts. Um, there's paranoia. Secrets are revealed. There's a Nazi. I mean, it's got everything. Uh, it's also a period piece taking place, I think, in like 1947. Um, and uh, Ted Gagan wrote the screenplay with consultation and help from his late father, who was a, an Air Force veteran. Hmm. So really getting the authenticity of these traumatized World War II veterans um, only a couple of years after the war had ended. So I'm really, really looking forward to this June 9th on Shutter, Brooklyn 4-5. Um, and really just check out Ted Gagan's uh, other other films. He is really putting out some some interesting stuff uh, that that's worth a watch. So yeah, June 9th. Awesome. Do you want to take a quick break? I do. Curious how to stock your shed with the tools that get the job of hunting, chasing, and terrorizing done? Do you dream of hacking out those pesky camp counselors at the lake? Do you have an unrelenting passion for revenge? Well, when your old standard kitchen knives and carving tools won't do, it's time to head down to Uncle Jason's Knives and Blades. Never sharpened, but always sharp, 
Uncle Jason's specialty killing tools will slice through all of those in your path without effort or exhaustion. You can choose from a variety of tools, rusted and weighted for your specifications. Intimidate onlookers, trespassers, and unsuspecting travelers alike with our custom tool display boards. Whether in your basement or shed, our discreet teams will come in and transform your space into its terrifyingly best. Head over to County Route 24, turn left at the no trespassing sign, and head into the barn and talk to one of our specialists. At Uncle Jason's Knives and Blades, we will fulfill our promise of only the most sinister and menacing knives and blades around. So come on down. This is a fake ad for a fake product on a horror-themed podcast. We do not condone or endorse killing people with fancy custom weapons you made in your shed. Well, my next recommendation is another movie. A movie? Also one um, that's going to be on streaming. Netflix. Oh. It's called Run, Rabbit, Run. Don't share your passwords. Um, Not to be confused with Rabbit Run, which is not, I mean, I guess it's a horror in its own right. But yes. It's a but very old movie, but it's, a, oh, this... it's an amazing movie. But this movie is a like horror thriller, Run, Rabbit, Run, coming out on June 28th on Netflix, starring um, Sarah Snook. Ah. Oh. Of uh, succession, succession fame. Um, Fuck off. Amazing run as um, Shiv Roy. And it's directed by uh, Diana Reed. She directed some episodes of The Handmaid's Tale, Ooh. The Outsider, which we love, yes. and Shining Girls. Oh, wow. The uh, Handmaid's Tale and Shining Girls starring Elizabeth Moss. And interestingly, Elizabeth Moss was supposed to be in this role oh but uh she, sarah snook replaced her she um, was busy fighting xenu and saving all of our thetans um she she's australian so it's an australian film um she's using her native australian accent in the film that's always a uh, um fun when like an actor that you primarily know with one accent start speaking in their native accent you're like whoa whoa hold on well for anybody that's watched succession and the end conversation after each episode you've already known yeah so um we've seen a lot of films about trauma and especially inherited trauma over the past few years hey, i guess that's one silver lining to all of us being damaged yeah like the babadook or hereditary mm. um so basically it's a, a play on that psychological fallout of generational trauma. So this film is about a divorced doctor um, played by Snook and she lives with her seven year old daughter and they deal with the fallout of some difficult events, the death of her grandfather. Um, she's, you know, dealing with her own reactions to that. And she finds out that her mother has dementia. So That's it's a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think that it basically shows the manifestation of that um, strange behavior in her own daughter and figure out what is inherited and what is not what's a reaction and what is something that is going to be part of her daughter's life. Um, so it's a very psychological horror thriller that looks really interesting to me on Netflix. Awesome. Well, I mean, Sarah Snook is a great actor, so yep. at the very least, got that. Yeah, and it seems like it's going to be, you know, in, the, in Australia, it's sort of remote and um, very minimal – uh, cast. Oh, anybody who's seen the the Wolf Creek uh, film or series um, uh, knows that's a great setting for for that kind of story. Mm -hmm. Anybody that is also, um, you know, watched Mad Max. I've never seen or heard of any of those hmm. movies. <laughs> I I wouldn't know. 
I'm just kidding. I, I fucking love them so much. Um, that sounds awesome. I have one more. Okay. I'm really excited about this one. I didn't do this on purpose. I'm glad you have a June 28th recommendation because I really front-loaded my choices. This is another June 9th pick. Um, so, yeah, I'm giving you two games to play on the 6th, and you have three days to finish them because you have two movies to watch on the 9th. Get cracking. Anyway, this one, oh, man, I'm really looking forward to this. It is The Angry Black Girl and Her Monster. Is um, this movie coming out on the 9th? It is coming out June 9th in theaters, written and directed by Bomani J. Story. Um, this is an uh, sort of an adaptation of Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. So, um, yeah, watch the trailer, everybody. It's a really, really, really good trailer. So, um, anyway, essentially... Uh, Leia de Leon Hayes plays a young teenager, Vicaria, who is an, a genius, living in a town that is plagued by gun violence and terrorized by a local um, kind of drug lord and a gang leader uh, played by Denzel Whitaker. So um, Vicaria is, she's a, a budding genius with a strange obsession with death, um, much like Victor Frankenstein did. So... Um, this becomes very real for her when her brother is gunned down um, and you know, murdered. Uh, now, she, at that point, decides that death is a disease that can be cured. And, of course, she tests that theory out on her recently murdered brother. So uh, that, I'm guessing, goes about the way you'd think it does. Um, now, the what really has me um, interested in this movie is... Apparently, uh, Hayes just turns in a tremendous performance as Vicaria. Um, Chad L. Coleman from The Wire and a bunch of other stuff is playing her dad, which is great. Now, I'm interested in this because it is a subversion of several tropes. Um, first off, you know, we have the, the Victor Frankenstein character about as different from Victor Frankenstein as you can get, you know. So instead of a megalomaniacal white European aristocratic scientist who's out to prove his own genius, you have a young teenage black girl living in working class America who's out to save her brother, but probably also with a touch of megalomania as well. I don't think you resurrect the dead without being a little full of yourself. Um, so anyway, it just, it looks really scary. It looks We're really so overcome with grief that you feel like, it's the only thing that will help. Well, watch the trailer. <laughs> I mean, I'm interested to see how Vicaria is um, is portrayed. It's certainly a complicated tale. Um, it's one that is unfortunately all too familiar to to many of us these days. Um, you know, so it, it's it's tackling a very real modern issue in um, in a way that horror is so often doing nowadays, um, taking real life trauma. Um, it's also another example of how far we've come in terms of representation in film. I mean, the days of movies like this were few and far between. Um, you'd really like once in a decade, <laughs> you'd get a movie uh, like this. And now we're getting um, authentic tales told through the lens of, of lived experiences. You know, um, these are our, our, our new stories. What? Well, they're actually old stories told through a new perspective. And but when I say new, I mean new in terms of its exposure to a mass audience. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, uh, I'm just really looking forward to this. I, obviously, Frankenstein is a story that's been told many, many times before. But I, and, uh, you know, the, the aforementioned um, Larry Fassenden himself did uh, his own um, interpretation of it with Depraved, which is a great movie. Um, but... Never like this, at least not that I'm aware. So I'm really looking forward to it. Also, and this comes across really well in the trailer, the fear that a genius black girl instills in people around her. I mean, not only is she dealing with the fact that a lot of people are afraid of intelligent women, not to mention intelligent women of color. So there's a lot of that as... as you're never really sure if the concern for Vicaria is is genuine or if it's because she's a genius young black girl and that is a threat. 
Um, and where is this going to be? This is going to be in theaters. Oh, excellent. Yeah. yeah. So check it out. June 9th. Um, the Angry Black Girl and Her Monster. Also, shit. A plus in terms of titles. That yeah, is fantastic. I'm really looking forward to this one. Yeah, I might have mentioned that. Um, so my one is called The Only One Left, and it's a book. It comes out on June 20th, and it's written by Riley Sager. Oh, we've heard that name before yeah, on this pod. I've read pretty much every Riley Sager book. Yeah. And you're you're a, a, a Sager stan? I, I have to admit, embarrassingly, that it's a nom de plume of Todd Ritter. I thought Riley Sager was a female writer. Oh. <gasps> And I apologize very much if I misled anyone on this pod or. Don't feel bad. I mean, isn't the point of a nom de plume, there's a certain element of deception to it. There's yeah. a, like a playful, you know, I, I I wouldn't feel too bad about being misled. I mean, I mean, his first novel. I'll never forgive Richard Bachman. His first novel under a Riley Sager was Final Girls. And that is. Yeah. A, an amazing book. Um, but he also wrote uh, The Last Time I Lied, Lock Every Door, Home Before Dark, Survive the Night, and The House Across the Lake, which was the most recent, which was not my favorite. Anyway, um, I wanted to sort of go through the plot summary of this because it it's, it needs to. Um, there's a schoolyard chant that is uh, sort of run through this summary so i'm gonna i'm gonna read you the chant um at 17 lenora hope hung her sister with a rope stabbed her father with a knife took her mother's happy life it wasn't me lenora said but she's the only one not dead so it takes place in a on a main coast town of hope's end um and there's a cliffside mansion where all this murder happened in 1929 and most people assume that she's responsible um and then in 1983 there's a home health aide that arrives at hope's end to care for lenora um after the previous nurse fled in the night and lenora was rendered mute by a series of strokes and can only communicate by tapping sentences on a typewriter so hmm. one night she taps, I want to tell you everything. Ooh. And so this nurse aide named Kit helps Lenora write about the events. And then we get to read along with it. So I think it just sounds like a really interesting premise. Um, I think that, I, I mean, I don't think. I know that I love unreliable narrators seems like this is gearing up to feel that way yeah yeah because we're getting someone's interpretation of a mute in a wheelchair aged typing this out I do. how do we know that this is the truth that she's typing i also love an unreliable narrator because we are for some reason just predisposed to believe what's written yeah um, which has been a real problem in the age of anyone can write anything and put it on the internet. Um, we just, for some reason, if it's written and published, we assume it's true. Um, right. And an unreliable narrator just smacks you across the face with that. And from the plot summary, it seems like Lenora, you know, might be telling a tale. I just want to remind you that head shakes and meaningful glances are not picked up by the microphones. Okay. Um, in in I just real quick, in fairness to to Todd Ritter, um, may have hoodwinked you, but the gender swap was never uh, intended. Um, I I believe uh, Mr. Ritter used gender neutral pronouns and kept it quite ambiguous uh in the beginning this was i think more of like a financial uh, decision um you know to publish books and whatnot and then uh, now i believe uses male pronouns and um, has his own picture on the on riley sager's website so i think uh just wanted to mention i don't think it was the author's intention to necessarily deceive anybody but he did 
at first leave it up to interpretation because what's the point of a pen name if you tell everybody about it? I, and, you know, I think to his credit, he writes these lead females of these thrillers very well. So That's fantastic. I mean, that's definitely a testament to, to his skill if, if you thought, you know, the authenticity was so spot on that it could only come from a, a female writer. Well done, Mr. Sager, if that is your real name. It's not. Oh, we did talk about that. <laughs> so check that one out. Awesome. I think that's all I have. That's all I have. Oh, it's going to be a busy month, y'all. Uh, time to put those air conditioners in windows and put your winter clothes away. Unless you live in like oh, a perpetually boy. hot area. I don't know. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't think that we need to tell people to do this. I think this has been already done. No? I think May is that month. I am not for me. I'm always cold. I don't put the sweaters away until August. We also have a collective recommendation. We do. Of a film. We occasionally agree on things. We do. Um, so this film is, I believe, coming out um, June 17th. Is that correct? 16th. 16th. Um, it's called The Blackening. Oh. Just in time for Juneteenth. At, you know, I love anything with an ending at the end of it. Yeah. So um, The Blackening, which it's a horror comedy. So it, it's a lot of different movies rolled into one, which I really like. A lot of tropes that we've already discussed on the pod. But um, it's, yeah, it's like a meta comedy. Yeah. It's a horror comedy um, directed by Tim Story. Which yeah. You know who he is. Yeah. Director of uh, the uh, the OG. Well, not the original, but the um, the, the mid 2000s Fantastic Four movie with Yoan Griffith and uh, Jessica Alba and Michael Chiklis. Right. Jamie Probably Bell. the most well known one of our. It, yeah. Well, and he, he did the follow up Rise of Silver Surfer. They were they were OK. You know, they were definitely better than the Josh Trank version. Um, but uh, well, interested this... to see him tackle this kind of movie yeah this is a uh based on a short film slash skit um from the comedy troupe three pete that uh played on comedy central and um it essentially follows an all african-american group of friends who um go to the, a cabin in the woods oh and they we've yeah, talked about that. They're little. basically picked off and murdered one by one. Uh, and what's really interesting and meta about this is the trope of, you know, the African American or a person of color is always killed off first in a horror movie. Yeah, the black guy always gets it. Yep. I mean, isn't there, there a book out? I'm sure. I mean, it's been there's like a book out. The, it, it's recently been too. dragged th so often and rightfully so. Um, you know the the idea like the the, the best ex this is not a horror movie but like one of the best examples of it is from uh an admittedly amazing movie the dirty dozen mm -hmm. the one mm -hmm. black member of the team played by jim brown when they get to the nazi castle his job is to like basically they, they're like okay somebody has to run across and drop grenades in these chimneys and whoever does this is definitely going to die and they basically all look at jim brown at the same time and they hand him the grenades and it's just like uh, uh okay you know i That's guess crazy well um it, they encounter at the cabin in the woods this group they encounter a mass killer who forces them to rank each member of the group by their degree of blackness oh my god to determine which is the correct order to kill them in yeah um and and the tagline um is we can't all die first oh god um it stars uh ex mayo who is in the most recent the swarm that swarm yeah show yeah um the, and the, the, another one that stephen king loves oh yeah i've heard unfortunately haven't seen but have heard that it's really amazing. Yeah. Jay Farrow is also cast. in this from um, Saturday Night Live. Yvonne Orhi from Insecure. I'm not sure if I'm spelling her name or saying her name right. Um, oh, yeah, but from Insecure, for sure. And Grace Byers, too. Yeah, Grace Byers yeah. as well um, from Empire. Yeah. So it's got a, a really exciting cast. Uh, Bloody Disgusting rated the film four out of five. Oh, we love Bloody Disgusting. So um, I think it's really interesting. The, the 
killer's choice of weapon is a crossbow. Um, Just quick again. shout out to my favorite horror critic out there, uh, Megan Navarro, writer for Bloody Disgusting. She's just always on point. Love yeah. her stuff. I think it looks great, and I think it looks fun and funny, and I love the sort of regaining of that power. Absolutely. What, what better way to take away the power of a harmful trope than to make fun of it absolutely you know and be like oh well what do you do when you encounter it sounds seven people in a cabin that are all black it sounds who dies first now? honestly one of the my favorite key and peel skits was when they were just two strangers walking towards each other on the street t- speaking in you know uh, whatever quote unquote their normal voice is but when they got near each other they put on their you know black voice yes yeah, right you know and started speaking completely differently just because they were close to each other <laughs> and then when they you know separated they reverted to their regular voices again i just i it's a ripe for comedy that's really funny and sounds like it could be like good uncomfortable comedy absolutely yeah I just want to give a quick shout out to a fun sounding book um, brought to you by Jeopardy champion and current co-host Ken Jennings. I just heard about this. Yeah, I just did. I just heard about it, too, which is why it's a quick recommendation. Yeah, it's like, oh, my God, I'm so excited. I thought that you would love this. This looks it, it is exactly right up my alley. It's 100 Places to See After You Die, A Travel Guide to the Afterlife. So what this is essentially, now Ken Jennings has written a few books, largely history books for kids, um, but he's got a pretty decent sense of humor. Mm -hmm. So I just heard about this, I looked it up, and apparently Ken Jennings explores stories of the afterlife, everything from Dante's uh, Inferno to the afterlife of NBC's The Good Place, mm-hmm. which we we do love very much. Uh, the, the Egyptian underworld, the Hindu god of death, uh, mythology ranging from, the, from ancient Rome to the Far East, uh, and just writing it like a travel guide. Mm-hmm. So talking about the best places to stay in the city of Dis, which concentric circle of Catholic hell has the best accommodations. So when you pass away... You'll have read this book, and so wherever you end up in the afterlife, you will have already brushed up on basically what to expect there. It's like the scene in Beetlejuice where they're in the waiting room after dying, and there's that book, you know, and she's like, "Don't lose this book." It's yeah, the guy. So this looks like a very fun, tongue-in-cheek, you know, macabre but lighthearted. Um, Book for for real nerds too, because it, it, this it seems like he gets really in the weeds. Um, I think there's something in there for fans of pop culture, for fans of history, for fans of theology, mythology. Do you think it includes like recommendations or places to stop along your travels? I'm hoping for some like Zagat's style star I hope system. So too. That you would know? be amazing. I and I, I I hope there are some negative reviews of like you know if you're in um, make sure you don't go to the seventh circle of hell because you know a lovely veranda <laughs> alongside the banks uh-huh. of the river sticks with water views if you're sensitive to heat <laughs> yeah it's gonna be it just looks really fun i i do like ken jennings and i love his story i mean to go from a nerdy fan of jeopardy to one of its all-time champions to hosting the fucking show itself that's that's yeah. man co-hosting. talk about a rise co-hosting of course no disrespect to my Imbialic. So, uh, yeah, that's 100 Places to See After You Die. It actually seems like a lot of fun. Maybe something to take to the beach. Nice. Perfect for the summer. If you are not perfect a vampire. Perfect for June. Yeah. Or if you're a day walker, you can, you can take it to the beach. For sure. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you. Hope we gave you some cool stuff to read, play, yeah, and watch. Yeah, check it out. And uh, we'll see you next episode. Bye. Terror in Tandem is written, produced, and recorded by Laura and Richard Mathiason, and edited and mixed by Richard Mathiason. Our theme was written and performed by Carrie Denver, and all other music was written and performed by David Zispanik. All opinions expressed on this podcast are our own and should be taken as such. Thanks for listening, and please remember to give us a like, a review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. 
Where's that?